Yeah, my name is Christian Tuschke. Um, <clears throat> I'm the lead of the team quantum computing at the Fraunhofer I.O. And today I have the pleasure to open this stage, uh, the Quantum BW stage of our booth here and give you some insights into this yeah, umbrella project um, as well as into running projects and develop, uh, yeah, and applications. So maybe, so Quantum BW in general was a as I said, an umbrella project which started uh, back uh, in April. So we uh, opened the project more or less with our uh, MP, so with uh, Ketchman, um, in, in tw uh, yeah, April 21. And <clears throat> it is over all the quantum um, projects in Baden-Württemberg, yeah, the umbrella and has, an, according to its strategy paper, which is, you can get it obviously on our booth here, just uh, behind me, or you can visit the homepage, but you see, okay, there's two main goals. It's like bundling the expertise of all the existing quantum, meaning not only computing, but also sensing projects, as well as transfer research. So from universities, from yeah, applied research organizations like Fraunhofer uh, to uh, the industry and change with this the market. So that's the, the two very uh, ambitious goals, obviously. And the part, so the company, oh, so there are different partners in this, uh, yeah, in this in this project. And these are companies. So the big companies in Baden-Württemberg are all their partner with LOI. So you see here, for example, Carl Zeiss, HQS, IBM, Mercedes, and so on. And Vision, obviously, which are mostly here around, but also the universities in Baden-Württemberg all participate in this kind of umbrella project. Uh, and beside that, there are these non-university research organizations uh, like Fraunhofer, like DLR, and like Max Planck Institute. So we, as an I.O., together with the Fraunhofer IF from Freiburg, uh, of Freiburg and uh, the University of Ulm, we, ha we had the Geschäftsstelle um, of, of this project and are mainly responsible so for also the guiding principles and the governance. So <clears throat> what does it mean? So in general, to boil it a bit down, what this, um, what this project means is um, it should strengthen and accelerate innovation in general. So that, that's one of the goals uh, in, in, in Baden-Württemberg. Then it should do qualification of specialists, so education programs, junior stuff, development, and to, to give, yeah, to uh, yeah, omit, for example, the gap of employees here in this uh, directly from, from, from the universities. And then to also like create a market for this, like corporations and investors, like do a yeah, startup environment for those kind of um, yeah, business uh, partners. Uh, so meaning startup in general is a big topic in Baden-Württemberg to make there a nice community and to accelerate uh, startup forming. So and this is all here, what's, what's in this strategy paper summarized into this uh, house, more or less of the three columns. We have computing, we have sensing, which is obviously very foreign, we have the communications. And on top we have these bars, which are like yeah, horizontal, like the education, the ecosystem forming, and also the infrastructure, like HPC infrastructure, quantum computing infrastructure. And then on top, this is very important, we have like the, um, the ministry and the, the boards, the advisory and the executive board, where both the Ministry for Economics as well as the Ministry uh, for Research are participating. So, <clears throat> yeah, so. Yeah, and they say, okay, we want to have, we want to become leader in quantum technologies here in Baden-Württemberg, and we want to have a leading position in this field, and get a like, uh, yeah, a broad availability over the next ten years here, and become international leader for quantum applications. So, <clears throat> and this goes along. So, the main goal of this project is to define in the end the roadmap for Baden-Württemberg. So, how should be funding within the next five to ten years? Uh, in these different kind of application regimes, so from startup forming five, from education uh, and, and and on the future work forces and four, uh, but also fund here basic research and cooperation research for applied for applied projects. Okay, <clears throat> but with this, so this is only the umbrella, and it's like. Not saying too much. I'm aware of this, but uh, yeah, it 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 tr uh, triggers synergy, uh, synergies, and there are different quantum uh, projects underneath this umbrella. And one of the very big activities is the Competence Center Quantum Computing in general. And this was a joint or is a joint research 
project itself, which itself consists of a lot of research activities within the last five years. So and there was the phase zero of this competence center and the phase zero of this competence center, the um, quantum computer, the IBM quantum computer in general was funded and installed. And, and then there were two phases in this competence center. So phase one, they both run more or less two years. <clears throat> so the first one ran exactly two years. Then we had six projects from both quantum hardware and software, and they all had the uh, requirement to be applied in the end. So um, we have here Sequoia, for example, which is a software project, the biggest software project for software engineering of industrial applications. But we also have different, like QC4BV, they develop uh, diamond-based spintronic quantum computers. So <clears throat> there are different projects with different focus fields uh, within uh, this competence center. And all of them are here on our booth next, uh, yeah, just behind us, and uh, yeah, uh, showing their results within the last few years. So this war ended in, uh, yeah, in the end of December 22. And then the second phase of the competence then started the last phase, which will last till the end of March next year. So, and there we still have like the follow-up of these former six, now five projects, which just proceed now and further develop their solutions in these different kind of fields. Okay, but <clears throat> so okay, now we zoom again, again a bit more into depth. So, in, a, in an actual project, so we now had two more or less like umbrella projects. Um, and now we come to so the Sequoia project in general. So <clears throat> this is a project, as I said, with the goal of making today's bottlenecks uh, yeah, in the entire quantum software uh, pipeline, so transparent, and providing solutions, so end-to-end -end solutions for different applications. Um, so meaning here we have two, uh, yeah, we have different bullet points which come here um, in the project. So we have use cases for sure. So we have industry partners, about 35 partners, which uh, so I combine the project and bring the use cases in. And then uh, these use cases are solved by algorithms. Um, yeah, and so current research, algorithm research is conducted in this in the Sequoia project. And then we have, in general, the very close, so it should run on this hardware, so on actual current quantum computers. So we need a lot of hardware software co-design in these algorithms. And so the project is called end-to-end -end because we need to want working solutions end-to-end. -end. So benchmarking is a big topic in this, in this project. So what's actually working, which algorithms are working, um, yeah, and, and what's important for these hardware software co-design solutions. And not only the very low stack is, is triggered, but all uh, is uh, dealt with, but also the higher quantum software engineering stack, like uh, more low, so that you don't need to be an expert to run at least these applications in the end. And knowledge transfer, it should come from the industry, it should go to the industry, what we learn here. So the partners are nine research organizations, so Fraunhofer for Fraunhofer Partners, I.O., uh, is in the lead, and then we have the FZI, the <coughs> HLRS, so the University of Stuttgart, the KIT, as well as the universities of Tübingen and Freiburg. And so these bullet points here, so those, were structured into a kind of like concept for, for, uh, for the Sequoia project, where we have here in the middle the, 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 so the, the company network, they bring in the use cases, they are solved with algorithms, they are executed on the computer, and then uh, transferred back to the knowledge, uh, to the industry. And yeah, so <clears throat> in general, these uh, intersections between these uh, circles, they are for us the main bottlenecks currently. So these are actually the, uh, the, the, it's the core business of Sequoia to make the caveats here transparent and to develop here working solutions. And overall, there's this quantum software engineering, which ensures the end-to-end -end and the usage of our applications. And what we are actually doing is we look at eight industrial problems these days and um, yeah, develop here different algorithms for different use cases. At the same time, we develop uh, yeah, quantum software development toolings, like toolings for optimal transpilation to really use the chip most efficiently, toolings for error mitigation that you reduce the amount of noise in an algorithm, we benchmark the SDK performance, Qiskit versus CERC versus Penny Lane on different infrastructures, CP, GPU based uh, for simulation, and benchmark in the end also hardware underneath like D-Wave versus IBM. 
Um, and then we develop here also quantum design patterns for the software engineering uh, aspect. And yeah, so um, best practices so, uh, and, and design space exploration from the quantum software um, point of view are also very important for this project and all this bar over all the circles and the knowledge transfer in the end um, is one of the crucial criteria. But good, so let's now dig deep. deep. So what are the use cases we are studying? So, <clears throat> so, one point, so they are more or less like from different branches, I would say. Um, and they come from engineering, meaning mostly quantum computational fluid dynamics, so QCFD, so uh, numerical fluid simulations, or resource optimization in, in the electromobility electro sector. Then also for our automotive part, we do a verification of neural networks and yeah, configuration prioritization for software systems like um, yeah, digital twins or whatever. And then we have the production, so there's cost optimization through production lines, so job shop problems in the end, as well as so the energy sector where we look at the resilience of energy infrastructures and possible scenarios how you can cure certain errors in an, in an infrastructure uh, if, if an error occurs. And then of the logistics is also a big topic for us. So these are mostly branches which are relevant for Baden-Württemberg. That's why they are funded from Baden-Württemberg, obviously. So chop shop and, and, so, and supply chain management as well as routing in general, so traveling salesperson problems are at the core of our, uh, of our use cases. And so all of them, I guess you can see in the detail and discuss with the experts who work on this uh, in detail in our booth. So I just brought now today two, uh, two I guess, yeah, two. So <clears throat> let's see, so this was this, for example, one of the problems is the optimal usage of an existing charging column infrastructure. So given a certain set of charging columns um, and a certain set of cars which need to be charged to charging plants, and then you see usually such kind of performance peaks over time. And this you want to reduce um, due to the fact that you want to be sustainable and you want to reduce, and it's expensive in, in the end, so you want to reduce these amount of peaks that you get a flat distribution. So in a charging plant, there's a combinatorial optimization. We are in the NISC area, uh, era, so that means we have small computers, meaning that we need to boil it down to a problem we actually can solve. So here we have now two cars with capacity of, I don't know, seven, seven charging units. And these seven charging units um, it should be distributed over the windows where they can be charged, such that the addition of these two Tetris uh, forms is more or less like flat. So, and this can be formulated in, an, in a program, so in an, yeah, si with side constraints such that everything is totally charged and you have a cost function which dictates you, so the lowest cost is the best solution. And this cost you then um, write as a so called Cubo matrix because in the end you need to transfer it to a quantum computer, and Cubos are classically something a quantum computer can good understand. They're related to Ising models. And in this scenario in this use case we solved it with this famous Quaba algorithm which is we start at a total superposition so at Schrödinger's cat all possible solution at the same time and then we do some kind of interference patterns such that we get in the end with every iteration in a hybrid fashion the correct uh, distribution of these charging uh, uh, yeah, capacities over time so and what did we actually um, yeah, get out here so <clears throat> so on the end, so this is this cubo matrix which you actually see here. And so there are two different scenarios here. Um, so you have these, I think it's eight qubits, two, four, six, eight, and they are coupled here very sparsely. So not every charging window is coupled to every charging window, then they are, it's very sparse, the cubo matrix. If you bring this cubo matrix with a quantum circuit to the back end, then you get at least here, these are the possible solutions and the probability with the highest probability here, this is simulated in black, and this is Eningen with a lot of noise, you see this, um, you get in the end, like, you actually get something for these kind of sparse matrices. But if you couple like the entire charging plan here, your cubo matrix is becoming denser and denser, uh, meaning your quantum circuits become longer and longer with the current form of noise. You can still simulate like this, is, this would be the right solution, but in the end you see something flat. So the computer doesn't give you back these days a really good thing if you have dense cubo matrices, even though it is only an eight qubit example. So, <clears throat> and what we also have seen is like, what, so what dictates us now a good, a good circuit? 
So is it the number of C nodes? There are different like um, scenarios which you can, uh, or, or metrics which you can have a look. Here we had a look of the a number of C nodes for the same algorithm, which different seeds, and we have a standard transpilation. We used here back these days Mapomatic and dynamical decoupling to improve results. And in blue, you see here the standard thing, and maybe the main information is hidden in the purple ones here, where you see that using both Mapomatic and dynamical decoupling, you increase the fidelity a lot. Yeah? But at the same time, in the beginning, you also get very small fidelities for small amount of, uh, of C knots. So C0 might be not the best thing. So we are working in the direction of what is a good metric to dictate if a quantum circuit is actually working. Another point is in these for the side constraints, you add these side constraints always with penalty terms such that you make it expensive if the side constraint is not expected in the Kubo formula. So and here you see actually what would be the right solution here uh, in red. Um, of solving the problem and in so you see the inning and data I guess here in black and for two different yeah penalty terms which just uh, yeah encode more or less how expensive is it if my boundary conditions are not fulfilled and this is extremely extremely uh, yeah vulnerable so this needs a lot of expertise knowledge because I mean you see how extreme this jumps by a uh, change of point 0.1 so <clears throat> here we also need an optimized version if people really want to use this algorithm and can, are not a uh, very deep expert. And the, the last, last point I want to show is in this Quaba algorithm there are different hyper par or parameters which you classically in a hybrid fashion always optimize. They are called here in the sense beta and gamma. And there are different landscapes of beta and gamma where the classical optimizer need to go through the optimization landscapes and always optimize the quantum solution with each iteration. This is sometimes easy, but in this case, for such a problem, it's very hard even for a classical optimizer to do here in gradient-based optimization, um, classically. So even this is really tough. Um, so something which we found out that Quava, yes, but Quava for which algorithm? How expensive or how difficult is it actually to get a running version? And <clears throat> based on this, we had now in the second phase of this project, we did several different experiments. Like here you see again the cube matrix which become denser and denser by coupling more and more time windows in this charging uh, plan. And here you see for this very sparse again you get high fidelities with these um, you see here standard uh, transpilations, error readout error mitigation, dynamical decoupling. So you get here um, for 75 different seats you get really high fidelity. But if you increase this you actually see that without dynamical decoupling, your fidelity is extremely at an extreme high relevance uh, variance, and yeah, it's very low. So you need this tool, for example, to get any reasonable result out of your uh, quantum calculation. Uh, but you see also that even with with so for a packed cubo matrix, even with these tools, you have a variance which is really tough. So to get out here with a high probability the right solution still needs a lot of work at this point. Good, and then we thought, okay, why? There's something like called crosstalk. I don't know if you heard from crosstalk. If you have three qubits, they have all the resonance level, and if you have one qubit here, which has more or less the same resonance like this, then if you ex uh, yeah, increase here the pulse, then you might change this one as well. This dictates an, is an error. So we thought, like, are these fidelities coming from these errors? Um, and then we, we compared different qubit combinations, so eight qubits, but always different on the chip and excluded and included these so-called crosstalk qubits. And there you actually see that, um, so we have again, so very similar qubit configurations are here, blue, red, uh, green, and uh, purple. And here we have with and without these crosstalk qubits. And you see that, so this is one time here simulated here, with where the simulated are shaded here always. And then the real inning and data are here in uh, yeah, bold color and you see for again so dynamical decoupling helps you a lot usually increasing from 0.2 to 0.6 of fidelity um, but not all that all the time and as and for sure it is not here so the difference is not that high that we can say this all the mistakes in the fidelity came from cross resonance so cross resonance is gives you some kind of an error yes but it's for sure not the one which we um, where we can pinpoint everything to yeah and 
So another very crucial statement here is um, that for we thought, okay, we have seen that a number of C nots is maybe not the best, uh, is not working as a metric for, for, for a circuit. So there's something called circuit score. Circuit score does not only count the number of C nots, but it includes a lot of error rates, single and two qubit error rates of this uh, of this circuit you have chosen. And then we had a look with different amount of uh, uh, qubit combinations um, with and without dynamical decoupling. Again, if circuit score uh, and uh, is getting better and better or is in general shouldn't depend that much um, for the qubits chosen. And again, also circuit score dictated us that you can have uh, for a for very similar set of qubits Ve and uh, yeah, extremely bad circuit scores, even though um, yeah, the qubits are very similar. So still, circuit score is not the right, uh, in our perspective, not the right metric to dictate if the circuit works or not. So there are other problems. I mean, maybe you have heard from um, like these two-level systems which can occur, uh, maybe this. But there are a lot of resources on these quantum chips um, which give us noise sources, which you did not yet capture fully into our uh, your prediction. And the prediction is always important if you want to have, in the end, the running solution. Good and interesting here, maybe, <coughs> is that, so this was Quawa results, and this was with the classical optimizer SLSQP. You see that, but interesting is for the Quawa approach, if you're aware, you have different number of ansatz functions which you have here and iterations in the square response you see that with SLSQP you see that your cost function we had in the beginning does not really good um, yeah, converge. We do, did the exactly same thing so so far we only talk about did talk about fidelity not of correctness of the solution and now uh, this is here about the cost function um, and the, then we tried out okay um, how does this now with even with higher number of iterations does this uh, converge to the right solution and it, it converges not that good and compared this to the VQE in general. So VQE is another variation quantum eigen, is a variation quantum eigen solver which reduces the energy of this cubo but instead of uh, reducing it like the quava which is yeah comes from the adiabatic annealing in the beginning so d-wave but on a quantum com IBM quantum computer there's another approach VQE which has way, way, way more free parameters to optimize than a classical optimization step, but you see the pay, uh, or the price, or at least the benefit is, that it really converges extremely good in this problem. So this showed that for that problem, it's way better to use actually VQE instead of Quava, because, and, and for, uh, I think this for the hardest problem, so P3, which was the totally uh, coupled Kubo matrix, the dense Kubo matrix. But then, <clears throat> and we also studied in here, how is this now not only, so how is the cost fluctuating with and without dynamical decoupling and also um, how does this perform actually on a simulation versus, versus Eningen results. So we can discuss this then later if you're interested here in the details. Okay, and then <coughs> last part, so this was all energy optimization of charging columns. Obviously, this are now a lot of details. <laughs> if you want to discuss this later, we are happy to welcome you in our booth. Um, another thing is, Simulations, no matter if you want to, so, so fluid simulations or if you want to simulate partial differential equations, I don't know, in digital twins or whatever. If you want to learn a differential equation, then so you in the end, so here we, we, we try to use uh, solve Navier-Stokes. Um, but so there is an exponential proven algorithm which can do this, HHL, um, which we cannot obviously uh, execute these days. Uh, then we tried another one, which is called VQLS in the first phase, the variational, so the VQE algorithm, but for linear systems and partial differential equations, which had also several problems like vector readouts and so on and so on. So we tried now different methods. They are called circuit learning methods for differential equations. So we learn, like with a quantum machine learning approach, the differential equation. Uh, so that's basically the approach. So you load in your circuit, you load, so you have a density matrix, then you rotate your x, so the function value which you want to approximate in a in rotation, and then you learn a certain parameter u in a parameterized, uh, circ uh, in a parameterized gate. And with this, you can actually create, if you, if you run it like this, you get a density matrix. If you then measure the x expectation value you get in function 
sin sine of x plus cosine of x, where you own, where you, where you're totally free of learning these prefactors. So you can reach more or less the entire uh, block sphere with this approach. Um, yeah. So we said, okay, good. Then, then let's learn a function with this and learn and yeah, okay. What I say, okay, there's even more. So, so far you can f learn functions of sine of x plus cosine of x, yeah? Um, but we want to learn higher um, f polynomial functions or different combinations. So you either have the, uh, you either can learn functions with higher orders of x if you do something like data re uploading and you uh, include these x all the time, but then you get very deep circuits. Or you do, and, and, and measure only one qubit line, or you do something uh, at more or less the x to a lot of qubit lines, so you make a width, bra a white, so, uh, uh, the width of the circuit and increase, and add entanglement, which also gives you then different kind of combinations uh, for, the, uh, for the functions you can learn. And I interesting is if you include here as an angle, so as a pulse, the nanoseconds here more or less in the, in the gate arc, sign, then you can actually also learn the polynomials and approximate every function. So we did this and learned here actually x to the power 3, x to the power, so all these functions were learned pretty good by using this circuit, 3 qubits, with one measurement and yeah, this is the x and then the variational circuits. And interesting is that we also used multiple channels, so where we learned in, so measured a second line and then we learned two functions at the same time more or less. But learning two functions at the same time can be also used to learn um, yeah, differential equations. So that's what here. So differential equations u prime g. And I can learn at the same time. So either uh, so the differential equation, so the solution out of this. So meaning that I can learn this equality uh, here and get out, get out um, yeah, the the, the solution of the differential equation. This is shown here. So here we also learned differential equations. This is the damped harmonic oscillator. So with a damping term, u prime prime plus u prime plus constant and prefactors, which actually has been learned on the back end with an yeah, SLSQP, I guess, here. And then here we already also coupled the harmonic oscillators by the readout of two qubit lines and could, could learn the coupled two harmonic oscillators. By calculating always, one should add this, um, the, we yeah, use the parameter shift rule to make the derivation of, of the learned function. Um, yeah, and so, but you see, so these are then data, uh, the learned data, you see that, yeah, actually, so with every, every derivative, obviously, the, uh, yeah, the distance to the learned function um, varies more and more. So this is still a problem, the errors in the, in the in the yeah, partial derivatives. Okay, good. So also this is like, if you want to discuss it, we, we showed this in our booth. Okay, and with this, um, <coughs> uh, I'll come to the end of the talk. Um, so if you're interested in the work of Sequoia, so we recently published a study, which is now printed finally also on our, on our booth. It's online though as well on the Publica link, uh, how to solve this. We have a uh, demonstrators online so all the Jupyter notebooks can be run on your own for free on our platform here at the Sequoia or via the Sequoia homepage if you want to go there different use cases with algorithms and yeah I did a lot of uh, github stuff there as well mitigation services by the University of Stuttgart and so on okay we also want to announce that we educate here in November we do a three-day education um, for free uh, actually, so it's already funded by the projects uh, in both in Stuttgart and Heilbronn um, and yeah, do there from the basics of uh, mathematics, linear algebra, quantum mechanics up to programming and applications, um, guide here and transfer this knowledge also in the spirit of quantum VW, transfer this knowledge to developers uh, in a very deep dive fashion. So you're happily invited. Um, so these are the modules which we show here. So yeah, as I said, linear algebra, so how to access IBM or D-Wave, then how are these systems made of, so the architecture, it's really hardware, up to algorithms, and then in the end, uh, the applications which we have a look at. Yeah, and uh, also recently, for transfer reasons, and there's a lot of stuff which we also have here on our booth, we installed an outreach center in Eningen, the QUACS, the Quantum AI Experience Center, which has certain kind of exhibitions, 
Um, most important here for this purpose is the physics lab and the quantum application software demonstrators, I guess, uh, which shows here, which is at the inning next to the quantum computer, actually. So, <clears throat> and here we show, for example, as a software solution, the truck fleet routing, the energy grid optimization, which I have just presented, price prediction, the computation fluid dynamics, and also have a VR visualization, the quantum coffee maker, which is today also everything around on the booth. Um, for obviously the last stuff is for gamification. <laughs> and yeah, and we, we showed the superconductivity, so doing the Meissner effect, spin momentum locking, not momentum, only, sp uh, yeah. We have the quantum sensors, NV sensors, um, a pole trap, and um, resonance circuits like IBM chip techniques, as well as um, discrete absorption lines uh, with natrium, natrium light lamps, steam lamp. Exactly, but a lot of that stuff is also here if you want to see it. Good, and with this I want to thank you. Um, yeah, so this was like starting a talk from starting with the umbrella, quantum BW, so over all of the quantum technologies, which should be the synergy and the fusion of the knowledge in Baden-Württemberg, to the competence center quantum computing, which is like an, an applied research project running the last four and a half years from mostly Fraunhofer and universities. Um, where we did a lot of software and hardware with the applied research goal. And yet there were different, Sequoia was the pr uh, work which I presented mostly the details from the application side. Good, if you have any questions, please come to our booth. And yeah, with this I would hand over then to my colleague, um, Barad. Thanks.